Awesome. They have my black towel with my gold symbol on there. Have one made for every show. No, I'm just kidding. I'm really kidding. And these are available at our booth, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> for a gift of $100, please, someone to our ministry. This is a very special. Oh, Lordy, Lordy, Lordy. Here I am. <laughs> well, that was a horrible movie. Man, they really <laughs> messed up old Fat Albert. But the cartoon was good, huh? Well, it's good to be here. I'm from Atlanta. From the dark streets. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but I am from Atlanta. Yeah. I run a ministry, which we're actually, we're calling it a church now, called Revolution. And we started in Phoenix in 1994 because there wasn't a place for hippies and punk rockers and skateboarders to go. Now it seems like there's not a place for preppy kids to go anymore. But, um... <laughs> I just want to be touched. Buffy, why won't they accept us? You know? <laughs> You have to have the polo ministry or something, you know? So, yeah, I should have wore a polo tonight to reach out to the lost people that we're rejecting, the conservative middle class. <laughs> um, well, we started this ministry to reach out to people. And I, I think what, what started to happen is is God changed my vision over time and, and the vision of the staff is it wasn't about punk rock or tattoos or scenes anymore it became about a message and a message of grace I'll tell you why the message of grace is so important to me if you were born before 1975 you know who my parents are if you're born after 1975 you probably won't unless you watch this real life um, but my dad is, uh, my mom and dad are Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. And they had, thank you, one person, all right. Um, <laughs> courtesy, thank you. What a lovely, it's too late, guys, I'm sorry. But you, my friend, this is how I'm facing the whole time. <laughs> You're dead to me. All right, I better get on the, on, on the clock here. We got the clock going, and here I have a whole friend from you specialties with a, with a knockout dart if I go too long. Oh, good God. Um, I like to just give a lot of dead time. It's my thing. It makes people laugh. Uncomfortable. I love making people uncomfortable. It's God's gift to me. But my parents went through a lot in the 80s. They lost their ministry. They lost everything. My dad ended up spending five years in prison. Um, the church wasn't really a place of, it was a place of refuge as long as you didn't screw up. It's like, hallelujah, brother. Everything's going great. All right, relax. <laughs> Everything's not going great. Goodbye. And I felt a, a strong rejection against my family. I mean, you got to think, Heritage USA was one, the biggest television ministry in the world. Uh, two, it was the third largest visited like vacation spot besides Disneyland and Disney World. So when my parents lost their ministry over a mistake that my dad had made seven or eight years prior, people turned their backs on my family. And there, weren't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of restoration. There wasn't a lot of love. There wasn't, you know, are you, am I mad about it? I was. Now I just want to make sure it doesn't happen again. And so we're talking about a place of safety. And I kept thinking, you know, place of safety. And, and, and every, you know, there, well, Jay, encourage him to go find a place of safety. And then I just started thinking, maybe grace is a place of safety. Maybe living in grace. What is grace? God's unconditional love, unmerited favor, undeserved favor, God's forgiveness, what he accomplished on the cross, the peace that passes all understanding. 
Unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there who don't feel that way about the church. I'm uh, friends with some people who or have run an organization called Relevate, and they had some folks do some research. They hired some research people, whatever they do. They research stuff and call you and bug you. You know, they're like, hey, can I do No, okay. But they did a, a research amongst 16 and 29 year olds about Christians. And, and it's really, really shocking what I read. And this was taken but just, just between people 16 and 29, no particular faith or anything. And this is what it says, 91% people think Christians are anti-homosexual. 87% believe that Christians are, 87% believes Christians are judgmental. 85% believe we're hypocritical. 78% believe we're old-fashioned. 75% believe we're too involved in politics. And 72 believe we're out of touch with reality. That's a bummer. <laughs> I'm 29, that's okay, so I just fell into that category. <laughs> and, and, and looking at a lot of that, I can understand why people feel that way. You know, the other day I was in a bike shop and talking to one of the guys that worked there and we just we were getting along, we had a lot in common. But also he's like, what do you do for a living? I was like, oh, it's interesting you ask. <laughs> I'm Pastor Reverend Bishop J. Baker. <laughs> I'm not really a bishop, I'm just teasing. And um, but you know what he did? He went, he stepped back because he was in awe and wonder of my glorious calling. No, um, because he'd been hurt. And in his mind, this is what he saw. He saw a hypocrite. He saw someone who hates gay people. He saw someone who, 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 who might not agree with the same things, have hurt him and made him feel hurt in the past. Now, automatically, when he was like, oh, you're one of those people, I wanted to be like, well, you're one of those straight edge, you know, just blah, 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 you know, tear him down the line. And I was like, wait a second. I can't blame him because I've been on the other side. See, I don't speak just out of ideas and like, man, I'll watch Christian television and it just stinks. You know, I, my parents invented Christian television, unfortunately. Unfortunately, for you who love it, fortunately, for you who are unfortunate. Um, it's a give or take kind of a thing. I mean, my dad was the original, started the host 700 Club, started, my parents started TBN and, and uh, those folks Paul and Jan ended up taking it from, you know, them, we, they turned it over to them. So that stuff, my parents had a lot to do with. A lot to do with Christianity in the 80s. And a lot of, a lot of rejection. And, and I, I just keep bringing that up is because I want to let you know is that I'm speaking from a heart of experience. Something that I've walked through. You know, I watched my parents get divorced and I watched the whole world watch my parents get divorced. I watched my father sit in prison for five years. The last year he was in prison, I did everything I could to fight to get him out of prison. His original sentence was 45. The judge didn't like him. The judge nickname was literally Maximum Bob. So, <laughs> you know, you might as well just get ready for a long trip. Luke 19, if you're following along in, in your Bibles. Luke 19, 1. Jesus entered into Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was one of the most influential Jews in the Roman tax collecting business. And he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. You guys ever remember that song? In your little... <laughs> we have been brainwashed, haven't we? That's the only reason I knew Zacchaeus. I'm like, he's a wee little man. Aren't you adorable, Zacchaeus? I just want to squeeze your cheeks. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree beside the road so he could watch from there. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him 
by his name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. The next part's what really, really just gets me, which I really love. For I must be a guest in your home today. Not like, hey, let's go have dinner over at the falafel house. Because that's what they eat back then, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> For I must be a guest at your home today. He f Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the crowds were displeased. He was, gone to be, he was going to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. You know, some people don't like it when we get grace. Some people don't like it when you step out of your comfort zone. And that's what I'm here to do. I ask you to step out of your comfort zone. And you're like, well, Jay, I'm comfortable with gangbangers who kill each other. I, well, it's time to maybe go to, <laughs> go to church or something. I don't know. <laughs> you want to talk dangerous, go to AG church, yo. I'm just dissing you. I'm just, I'm just dissing you. Don't worry about it. Now, I grew up AG, guys. Relax. Nobody's got the, the corner on Jesus. I'm just jaded, baby. Um, but here he said, Zacchaeus, I got to be a guest at your house. I got to come over. I got to be there tonight. I've got to come. Jesus said, I've got to get out of my comfort zone. I've got to meet you where you're at. You know, and that's a lot of what we do in my ministry and the church, that God, the, the church that God's called me to do is getting outside of our comfort zone. We meet at a bar, and we're not like, oh, yeah, we ran out of bar. It's really hot. No, we meet at a club, and it's a bar, and it's open while we're there. Every now and then you'll see the congregation with the big, tall, paps, blue ribbon going, hey, man, bro, free bird, you know? It's quite amazing. And you say, well, Jay, why would you go to such a place? Because they asked us to come. They said, you know what, we heard a lot of good things about you guys. You have a really good reputation around town, and we want you to be here. I didn't believe it. I thought every single person was lying to me until I went to the club and found out. I'm like, wow, they're playing a trick on me. I'm going to feel like a dumb idiot. Like, do you guys want us here? And they're like, yeah. They gave us the first, like, three months free. After that, we have to pay because the bar's not doing as good as it used to. <laughs> doesn't help that I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm like, hey, kids, don't go down that road. Don't go down. <laughs> this is my sobriety chip. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just... So the bar is our comfort zone. Right now, I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm hanging out with a large room of Christians. <laughs> Come on, guys. I know, I'm just not that exciting. <laughs> Carla kept reminding me that I was the white boy here today. She's like, you're just going to be the great white boy on stage tonight. You know. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true, man. I, I know. Um, anyhow. I'm going to have a dance off with that guy later. Um, oh, I'm from Bankhead, baby. So anyhow, <laughs> you got served. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I don't even know who said that, so I, it's one of you guys, and I'm not sure who, but I love you. I'm just teasing. <laughs> you really helped me out, because I'll never finish this sermon. Um, good night. You've been a good crowd. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and I have overcharged people their taxes, and I will give back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a son of Abraham. And I, the son of, and I, the son of man, have come to seek and save those like him who are lost. Now, you think, well, he gave all that stuff, and he made sacrifices, so Jesus forgave him. That's awesome. No, he said he's a son of Abraham. Does anybody remember the story of Abraham? And, and Abraham was like, you know, the Lord was like, Abraham. He's like, yes, Lord. And he's like, you want to, I'm going to give you a son, and you're going to have descendants as many as the stars. And he's like, 
yes, Lord, I believe you. And then it says, you know, he was made, you know, he was holy and blameless. And, you know, he was right on with Jesus at that point, and, and everything was cool. Jesus. Jesus was there. He was just hiding in the background. And... Uh, <laughs> But he was, he was made a righteous man because of his faith, not because of his works. But you know what he did right after that? That's awesome, God. Could you prove that to me? He was made righteous by his faith, but he still wanted proof. Because see, sometimes faith, sometimes faith, you even question in faith. That's a part of faith. Part of faith is it's not always tangible. It's not always something you grasp. So the point is, is it wasn't just the fact that he gave everything away. It was the fact that he believed that he was God. He believed that Jesus was God because he came over and he said, I got to be a guest at your house tonight, no matter, despite what people think. I don't care. He brought grace to that home. He made grace a place of refuge, a place of safety at his home. People are dying for that. My friends are looking for someone to, to love them. Every time you know, I hang out in the bars and stuff, and everybody's like, you're really cool for a Christian, man. I hate that. You're really cool for a Christian. You know, I hate the fact that some, they're always waiting to get a club beat over their head. Or they're wanting, you know, oh, don't. They, even this kid, I gave him my card, and I said, yeah, you should check out our website. But, hey, I'm not coming to your church. I'm not coming to your church. I was like, I'm not asking you to come to my church. You know, just check out the website. And see, I think we think if we can just continue to do all these big events and, you know, we can get a really good killer band and we can get whatever and we can bring people to us. But the point is, is what is Jesus doing here? He's going to them. What did he do with Matthew? He went to them. And you might say, well, Jay, the, you know, those type of people, you know, I, I, my church doesn't really like those type of people here or my ministry, we just, we aimed at these type of folks and... You know, I kind of have a heart for them. But the point is you don't have to bring them into the church and sit them down and say, you're going to be part of the group, young people. You can go buy some pizza at, and hang out. You can go to a bar and sit down with someone over 21 and, and talk to them and hang out with them and get to know them and build a relationship and be their friend and just love them. You know what people are tired of is, 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 is I think they, they feel that we have a hidden motive. And I think maybe we do sometimes. But friendships with hidden motives is not friendships at all. Loving people with a hidden motive is, is you know, oh, well, I know what's good for you, buddy. <laughs> you know? People want to, you know, think about if you had a friend and you're like, man, my Buddhist brother, he's such a good guy. You know, he's Buddhist. It's awesome. We, we have a lot of cool talks. He's all into the Zen and stuff. And... Uh, then you find out, like, he's not really your friend, man. I heard the other day that he's like, once he gets you to be enlightened, he'll, he's, he'll feel good like he can move on with life. You'd be like, oh, man, that sucks. I'm sorry if that word offends you. I, just, there's a few words allowed in my house, and that was one of them. Whenever my mom was in a good mood. That and crap. And damn, those are the only ones that are allowed. Everything else, I had to get my mouth washed out. Because <laughs> I just remind her, I'm like, you said that, mama. <laughs> okay. Look at John 4 with me, if you will. John 4, 4. John 4, 4. See, I'm just your nerdy friend up here talking. That's all I am. <laughs> I'm not cool. I don't do a little dance. I don't, you know, I don't do anything cool. <laughs> I talk about comic books, though, like our... That message, were you guys here this morning or this afternoon? That was awesome. That was super awesome. Except I always thought of myself as Batman, so I feel kind of bad now. <laughs> I'm like America's greatest hero or something. I don't know. You have to be old to remember that stuff. Believe it or not. Okay. It's the last night. We can relax a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with some deep stuff here in my last 15 minutes and 21, 20 seconds. Where are we going? 4-4. Four, four. He had to go through Samaria. 
4.3 says, so he left Judea to return to Galilee, this is Jesus, and he had to go through Samaria. What, Jesus had to go through Samaria again? Well, anybody knows that a good Jewish boy at this time, going from Judea to Galilee, would completely walk all the way around Samaria because they didn't hang out with Samaritans. They were scum, you would be in ceremonially clean, you just didn't do it. But Jesus said, I have to go through there. And then what does he do? He goes to a well, and, well, well, I'm from country. He goes to the well and talks to a woman. Another very socially unacceptable thing at the time. The woman was surprised, for Jews refuse to have anything to do with Samaritans, she said to Jesus. You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jump over to 27. She, he tells him everything about her, you know, read it. It's an awesome story if you haven't heard it, but I'm sure your pastor's probably preached it or something. 27 says, Jesus then, okay, just then disciples arrived. They were astonished to find him talking to a woman, but none of them asked him why he was doing it or what they had been discussing. You know, you're like, okay, I really think this guy's the Messiah. We're hanging out with him. We've seen some miracles. You know, I think it's him. I mean, even when he was like floating up into heaven, they were like, that must have been the Savior. You know, and so they walk up and he's like, he's like hanging out with a woman at the well by himself. And they're like, okay, <laughs> this is uncomfortable. You know, I mean, pastors today won't go like meet with a woman one-on-one. -on -one, you know what I mean? So imagine back then. I don't know. We just got to start training ourselves how to handle stuff. 31 says, meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus to eat. He said, no, he said, I have food you don't know about. And they were like, who brought it to him? I'm like one of those cheesy Bible tapes. The disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained. My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me <laughs> and from finishing his work. Jesus was fed by going out of the way. You go, well, I go to church and I'm just not fed. I went through an episode where half the people in my church left because they were like, I'm just not getting fed, brother. You're just talking about love and grace and Jesus and hope and all that stuff. I don't feel guilty enough. I've got to go. <laughs> I need a big stake of guilt. I'm like, well, yeah, well, it's easier to feel guilty than it is to have convictions to love people. Because loving people takes a while. It takes some patience. It really does. And uh, if you have patience and you're in for the long haul, power to the people, maybe. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I'm just a random guy sitting up here. Who loves a girl? No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm right. <laughs> my nourishment comes through in the world of God. God's saying, Jesus is saying, I get my food when I love people. I get my food when I find the rejects of the rejects, because she, re she was outcast amongst the Samaritans who were already rejects. More than likely, she was unbarren, is my guess. I think people are always like, she was a hoe and she's getting around. I think she probably just got married over and over again and she couldn't have babies and they, you're no good to us. But she, that's my guess. Theology, it's awesome. Do you care for some cookies or juice? Help yourself. <laughs> um, that's strange. Um, I'm almost done. Because it's... Anyhow. <laughs> oh, I didn't know I was that bald. Dang. Um, that's me in the security camera at places where I'm like, man, at least I'm not as bald as that guy. That's my, that's the story of my life. <laughs> Lighthearted preaching. But no, but Jesus said, I get fed from going outside of the expected areas and doing the expected, I go out to the dangerous areas. I get excited about being unclean. I get excited about going up to tax collectors in the midst of their tax collecting and saying, hey, you want to be my disciple and write a book in my Bible? And then we see people with sin in their life and we're like, Lordy, Lordy, mm hmm Oh, we just got to get your life straightened out, brother. You're just a sinful creature. We're all sinful creatures. We all fall short. Jesus calls Matthew in the mix of tax collecting. He can call you in the midst of just about anything. Christ is constantly pursuing us. Why are we surprised when someone in the midst of something crazy gets called?
I think we're missing the point. I think a lot of the times we give sin its power back, especially because we love our programs. Come on, we love our programs. Heck, man, I love my programs. You guys should be doing my programs for 1995. Um, I can get you doing my programs. No. We, we, we love our programs. We're, we love to do these things. But, you know, sometimes in our programs we're like, all right, come on in, man. I'm going to help you get your life together. Oh, you cussed? That's one demerit. Two more and you're out. Oh, you drank? Yeah, what's another one? Oh, you cussed at me. Well, that's like, out, you're out. <laughs> See you later. God's grace, three times. There you go. I'm making anybody uncomfortable yet. Please, thank you. We, we want to put conditions on love. And what are we kind of the message we send? I've had friends who are in, 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 in ministry groups who've been kicked out because they don't wear safety shirts. And I don't even know what that is. You know, they don't do these things. And it's like, where in the Bible does it talk about this stuff? And why all of a sudden I can't be in ministry? Because I said a four-letter word. Come on now. Yeah, I love it. When we're in a group of people, we're like, cussing, no kidding. That is some horrible stuff. Yeah. Stub your toe at home, or you're talking to your wife, and you'd be like, mm -hmm. you know, you're with your friend, your boy you haven't seen in a while. I'm cool, I'm a cool Christian, I cuss, it's what up. You know, I'm down. Is that good? Does that work? Um, <laughs> does that work, guys? Come on, I need to know. And we're sending a mixed signal that says, God, you know what that signal was sent to me until I was about 19 years old? said, Jay, you're a mistake. God doesn't love you just the way you are. There's something wrong with you. I thought because I couldn't quit sinning, I couldn't stop being tempted that God hated me and made a mistake. I saw what they did to my dad. Why did I have anything different to believe? I saw what happened to my parents. I saw what my sister went through. I watched my dad like make Christian musicians millionaires. And I watched my sister be, a, you know, just a few dollars away from being homeless. You know, we're known as the only army that kills its wounded. This has got to stop. We got to stop killing each other. We got to start loving each other because you know what? We can't reach out unless we start loving each other. I must be doing something right because I'm getting the half clap. <laughs> I can't wait to get that comment card, yo. I hate those comment cards, man. I don't like them. It's like, you invited me to be here. You don't need to know anything about me speaking. <laughs> Trust God. <laughs> I've had people yell and scream at me and three years later be like, you changed my life, brother. <laughs> it's like, wow, I've hated you for three years. That's awesome. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I don't hate anybody, but... Luke 3. Oh, man. We're getting close. Oh, man. The clock. I'm going to go. I'm going to do it. You specialty stop. No, I'm just kidding. Trust me. Because of that moment, I've had to sign like 15 contracts that I'll never go over time. Not here, though. Because <laughs> they're like, we love you, Jay. We want you to go for hours. Matthew, Mark, and then it's Luke. So I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. I have dyslexia. I need, I need this place to... You've got to be patient with me. I'm special. I so badly want to be like a tough, badass speaker, but I'm just like... So anyway, guys, i got lots of tattoos. How's it going? Um... So there you go. I'm glad to be me, yo. Luke 3.15, here we go. Oh, man, please take your notes right next time, Jay. Where is Luke 3.15? You won't believe this. Oh, Luke 15. That E looked to look a lot like 3. <laughs> You're like, how in the heck is this guy's... If See, I'm just here to encourage you to be professional speakers. <laughs> this is what I do for a living. It's, it's what I'm best at. Except for sleeping and 
and I'm not very good at that anymore anyway. Luke 15, all right, here we go, one. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such despicable people, even eating with them. Jesus was always making people mad. He was always eating. He was killed because he loved everybody and he accepted everybody. You know, so next time you're like, I don't know, the Pharisees were the exclusive ones. The Pharisees were the ones who were saying this, this, and that, and but. Check your heart. Check yourself. Are you religious? Are you a Pharisee? Are you turning into a Pharisee? It happens to me all the time. You know, I've got nine years sober, so I, when I go out with my buddies who drink, I'm like, man, I am so awesome. I do not drink. I am awesome. I am so better than you guys. You know what I'm saying? My wife will have a drink. I'm like, yeah, my wife has a drink, but not me. I don't touch the stuff. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I've been delivered. I've been delivered by the blood of the Lamb. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Don't make me preach. All right. Here we go again. Here we go again. <laughs> I love public enemy. So Jesus used this illustration. <laughs> if you had 100 sheep and one of them strayed away and was lost in the wilderness, wouldn't you leave the 99 others to go search for the lost one until you found it? No. If I had 99 sheep, I'd be freaked out. <laughs> if I had 99 people in my congregation, I'd be freaked out. So that's my honest answer. <laughs> and then you would joyfully carry it home on your shoulder. <laughs> no. I'd be like, oh, I lost another sheep. Why do they hate me? It's because my speaking's so horrible. <laughs> when you arrived, you would call together your friends and neighbors and rejoice with them because your lost sheep was found. In the same way, heaven will be happier over one lost sinner who returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Your righteousness ain't all that. People are dying and hurting and they feel hated by God, and they're waiting for us to come out and say, I love you, and you know what? If you don't accept God, I'm going to love you, and if you curse me, I'm going to love you, because Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 says, love never gives up, never loses faith, always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. That even says it keeps no record of when it's been wronged. We're Christians, and people think all you do is keep records. All you do is demand your own way. I can't even bring a glass of water into the service because everybody's worried about the carpet. Rip the freaking carpet out. I mean, when did these things become more important than people? When did our programs become more important than people? Well, I'd love to go out there, but I've got that Sewing for Jesus class at four. And it's pretty awesome. And you know what the problem is sometimes is it's not the, that you're saying, well, I want to go out. It's the 99 who are like, Pastor, you gotta, you got to take care of us. We like our, we like, you know, you got to be here on Sunday. You got to be here this. We got to do this. You know, we're, we're the important ones. You know, and it's like we get so self-consumed with, 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 with Christian that we've built a bubble. And then when you, we go out into reality, into the world, we think, what is this place? Why is it so horrible? It's so, it's so crazy and so insecure. You know, that's where I live. I live with people who are hurting. I live with people who hate Christians, and probably some of them even hate Jesus. And that breaks my heart. And it makes me want to be like, I love you, I love you, and, but that's all I can do is love them. You know, then the story goes on to the coin, and then the story goes on to the, 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 the prodigal son who, who ran away. And the whole point is God's never giving up. He's always going the distance. Why aren't we willing to go the distance? I'm willing to go the distance. That's why I'm here. Today I was petrified. When I did my afternoon group, I was literally petrified. Came home to my wife. I'm like, I'm exhausted. I've got nothing left in me. I don't know what to do. I've got 31 seconds. Um, <laughs> I was petrified. I promise I won't go too long after, after my time. I, I, I do want to respect those boundaries. I, I really want to. So I better stop talking now. Um, you know, and I got home and I said, I feel 
exhausted, I feel freaked out, I feel like, you know, what am I doing with my life, you know, why am I speaking, why, you know, you know, why do I come, you know, I've got this church at home and it works, maybe I could write books and just be happy, but I have dyslexia, so I end up having to speak to y'all. Um, <laughs> why can I learn to play an instrument? <laughs> and I've been a rock star and be like, Jesus, you're awesome. <laughs> and uh, let's go back to the bus and get a beer. <laughs> Suckers. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm teasing. I'm like, I defend my Christian brothers. They're good guys out there on the road. And they're working hard for you. Love them. But Amanda was like, this is what you're here to do. My wife is like, you're here to do this. You're here to preach grace. You're here to love these people. When I got home, I opened the Bible, and I, this never happens to me. I always want it to happen to me, and it happened to me today. And it said, when you're weak, I am strong. When Paul was asking, please take my sin away, and he goes, no, in your weakness, I shine more. And I was like, thank you, Lord. Um, that's awesome. Um, so finally, the Bible opened up to a place that actually made sense. <laughs> I've always wanted to open it all as permissible, not all as beneficial, but it never does. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm teasing. I'm a jokester. I got baby talk for you. <laughs> what do we do when we get there? What do we do when we get to the uncomfortable place? Do we make them feel guilty and like crap and tell them to repent? No, we love them. We draw them to Christ. People are tying, tired of being driven to Jesus. You know, we're like, mm, mm, if you die tonight, brother, where would you go? You better get in the car. <laughs> I think sometimes we just need to learn how to shut our mouths and control our tongues. I think sometimes we could just maybe just go in the voting booth and not talk about the issues. We're all a bunch of, you know, we're, I'm, I'm not represented by one political group. When did Jesus become represented by a political group anyway? When did we start thinking politicians were men of God? Oh, oh, oh it's got quiet in here. <laughs> That's right, you guys got Arnold though, huh? I'd feel the same way. Um, well, I'm serious. Uh, please, I mean, please, I, if you think that, I, I, just re I would just expect you to just really don't be, don't be illusioned by that. That is, be disillusioned by it. Because people are people. God isn't Democrat or Republican or Independent or Green Party. God is God. God is a God of love and mercy and grace. And then the other 99 believe that God is a Republican. Awesome. All right. <laughs> work on that. When you go home, I want you to work on that. Subscribe to a magazine called Sojourners. It's really awesome. <laughs> or just read Messy Spirituality by Mike Iaconelli, the greatest book ever written besides the Bible. It's good. Messy Spirituality. I'm almost done. So what do we do when we get there to love? No matter who they are, no matter what they are. That's what Romans says. Love people no matter who you are, no matter what you've done. All sin, all fall short of God's standard. Be a God in His gracious kindness declares us not guilty. That's what we do. This is why Jesus was killed. It's because we're called to not give up. We're called to get outside of our comfort zone. We're called to go and love people. And you know what? All of you are going to be called to go to the Democratic Convention and love those people and serve drinks. You know, because God is telling us to be servants and to love people and humble ourselves, not be prideful and arrogant about how wonderful our morality is. Do you know what 1 Peter says true morality leads to? Loving all people. If you don't, you're not, Christ, God has not been fulfilled in you. It's like we stopped at morality and like being good people and then we forgot about loving each other and loving everybody. I'm serious. That is our goal is to love all people. Love God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Then Jesus even up to Annie and said, I'm going to give you a new commandment. I want you guys to love each other. I want you to love each other as I love you. I want you to go into the places. I want to go where you're uncomfortable. I want you to go where you're going to be persecuted for going there and love those people. Oh, I'm sorry, I'd really love to win that person to Christ or just really just love on them and care for them and give them some hope in their life, but if I was seen there, that would be it. I 
I'm concerned about the church. I'm concerned about what we're doing to each other. I'm concerned about what's happening to the world. I don't want my friends to be hurt. I went to a Christian festival a few months ago. I mean, my wife was so hurt by some of the things there, she just said, I can't go back tomorrow. How are we going to prove to the world that God loves you no matter who you are or what you've done? It doesn't, you know, God loves you if you're gay or straight or, or crazy or nerdy or, or, you know, dirty. Or God loves you in the midst of grace and disgrace. And it's like, what? If, oh, well, Jay, but that's a license of sin. Have we forgotten about the Holy Spirit? Do we not trust the Holy Spirit in people's lives anymore? God's saying, go out, reach out, love them, care about them. I will draw them into my presence. I believe when the Bible, when James talks about faith without works is dead, as he's saying it will not reproduce. I don't think it means we're going to hell without works. What I believe it means is that if we don't have works, and, we, and works is loving people, if you don't know what that is. Everybody thinks it, sometimes thinks it's other things, but it's peace and patience and kindness and putting other people before you. It's serving people. That's what works really is. It's not all about, you know, well, I don't do this and I don't do that. You know, it's about I do this, I do that. I'm compassionate. I care about people. And that's a hard, hard thing to do. But if we don't want, or we're not willing to go the extra mile, we won't reproduce. And I encourage you. You know what? And someone, I, I this is, I'm ending right here. Someone might get mad at you. A few, couple years ago when I was at Youth Specialties and I went over time like I did now. Um, <laughs> I'm so insecure, it's awesome. Um, and this, we had a Q&A afterwards. And this guy stood up and screamed at me and was like, Universalist, you're a heretic, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like wow, I, I really am not a universalist, I promise. And, uh, but he screamed at me and yelled at me, and it like, really hurt my feelings and broke my heart, and I was really rejected by this person. And it didn't matter that 100 people were like, that was awesome, Jay, it was that one guy. Well, this weekend, I was at a church in Florida. Some guy comes up to me and he's like, man, your ministry's awesome. I go on your website. Uh, I attend your church over the website. Your, your books really changed my life, you know, and... I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much. And he's like, but I do have a confession to make. And I was like, yeah, what's that? And I'm not knowing. And he's like, I was the guy who yelled and screamed at you. Sometimes the people yelling and screaming and judging you may actually be learning from you. You know, David said he wouldn't have been David without Saul. And he said, you, you showed me what real grace was. And I said, no, I didn't, you know, it was Jesus, you know, and, and, and all that stuff. And, and, and it made a difference. So people are watching you. They're watching to see if you're, because you know what? If the people lead, the leaders will follow. And I'm encouraging you. Set an example. Set an example for me. Set an example for the leaders here. Go out, take a chance, walk outside your comfort zone, and offer grace to people because I promise you grace is a place of refuge. Thank you guys. Good night. Jay. Jay, we love you.